All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews every Monday and every Friday right here on YouTube. You got to make sure you subscribe, support the channel, and also find out when all these cool interviews are going to happen. Now, maybe you've watched my interviews and you thought, I could ask better questions. Well, go down to my Patreon, sign up, and maybe you can ask questions of my next guest. And speaking of guests, today, the voice of Rat, Stephen Piercy, is here. He's promoting his new movie. It's a rockumentary, I should say. It's called Nothing to Lose. It's available on Asai TV. We're going to explain to you how to find that in just a little bit. Also, it's almost 40 years since Rat uh, started. Could there be a reunion? What do the guys think? Is it possible? We are going to find out all of that and more right after this. All right, we waited long enough. Here he is, Stephen Piercy. Hello, how are you? Stephen, it's good to see you. Good to see. <laughs> I, I, I was texting you every week, telling you, you got to come on here. We got to talk. And we finally have a good topic. Yeah. First, I want to say um, Dusty Hill, rest in peace. Easy top, man. Terrible news. And yeah. Joey, the other day, all these people, I mean, Let's uh, treat ourselves good, people. Well, yeah, right before we are uh, broadcasting and recording this, Dusty Hill from ZZ Top has passed away. And this has been a really hard week for rock and roll. And Stephen, you really are a rock and roll survivor. I'm sure mm -hmm. there's times where you can't believe you're still here. A hundred percent. And, you know, I mean, look, it's all fun and, and jest and, you know, the whole what's turned into this 80s metal this hair thing this whatever you know it was just a lifestyle and and it took a bunch of people down and and um you know those who are standing got a wake-up call and and it's a different uh atmosphere so to speak i mean but I don't think there'll ever be a decade like that again regardless of the decadence you know um but yeah, I'm surprised. I uh, <laughs> what's uh, Robin used to call me, uh, Steve Knievel. <laughs> yeah, well, for a it, reason. It, well, Stephen, you know this um, this movie that we're talking about really does yeah. outline your life. And for people who might not know, this is a really good companion to your book. You know, the book uh, "Sex, Drugs, Rat and Roll" outlines mm -hmm. your career. But in this movie, you give people a chance to see some of the places that you spoke about. So I want to first show this here. Okay, so this is the movie. Out of the Cellar and Into the 80s Sunset Strip, Stephen Pierce's rockumentary, Nothing to Lose. And you can find this on ASY TV. Now, ASY is a new service. Only costs $5 to sign up. It's pretty easy. You can get it on Fire TV, Amazon. You can get it on Roku. Stephen's, Stephen's going to download mm -hmm. it right now. Look at that. Okay, so I want you to tell me how this movie comes about. Well, it came about uh, um, months back when I created this thing called uh, Backstage Past. It was a project which is now called Back for More. And it's still a work in prog progress. And it's going to consist of, um, you know, seeing what legacy the artist, you know, artists want to leave and what they think and their life. And I'm, we thought about it and went, well, you know, nobody's really ever done a real rock you docu of my band, Mickey, you know, Mickey Rat, how it evolved into Rat and the whole process. The book doesn't dabble in that. There will be another one eventually. So we decided, uh, Christy and I, who's working with the company, a production company, to put together something uh, uh, with a side TV. And it's a three-parter. So what you're seeing now is just the beginning. You know, me forming the band, taking you back. I mean, showing you things, telling you stories. Never been done. Not even behind the uh, music would cover it or... Uh, the uh, long form video that we did um, back in the day. So I get really deep in there. I take you to places 
And then, you know, it's progression, like I say, a part two and a part three. The part three, we'll see what happens, you know. Uh, and I'm sure we'll touch on that subject, but it, it's going to take you through the whole process. And what we have here with nothing to lose is me creating this band by default called Mickey Rat, um, uh, migrating to Los Angeles, you know, and, and here we are. I'm at the whiskey, you know, yeah. go, go, and then thrown into part two and then part three. You know. Yeah, and, and the, obviously, like you say, the future's unwritten, but we're going to try to find out a little about that. Stephen, I had on some of the guys from Rough Cut, and I uh, had a Matt on and a mirror, and I, I didn't realize that there was such a scene in San Diego, so much talent. And so in the beginning of your movie, you go back to San Diego, you go back to the house that you grew up in, which is really amazing to see. Mm -hmm. um, but tell me about some of the musicians who were around in San Diego when you moved. You moved in 1971, I believe. No, I moved. Yeah, I moved to San Diego from L.A. in 1971. I had nothing to do with music. Didn't want, you know, I just listened to it. And, you know, I remember getting my first Black Sabbath record with headphones. I mean, the whole gamut in the early 70s. So um, I migrate to, I'm with a racing car team. And in 70. Or I find myself in San Diego. That's where we live now. So, you know, I take you through me getting in this horrific accident and lo and behold, I get a guitar and, you know, I go through the whole story, but, you know, I end up in a couple of bands and then I started a band called Mickey Rat with one of the guys from Rough Cut, Chris Hager. And who all of these characters are actually rat bastards in one sense or another, you know, Jakey Lee, uh, Matt Thorne, Chris Hager. Um, oh God, plenty of guys um, who hung out, who hung into the game and then who pulled out of the music business. Right. Um, so a lot of people, when I migrated in 1980, um, a lot of these guys, followed but the scene in san diego was crazy because you had robin's band phenomenon warren actually had a band called excalibur jakey lee had a band called teaser uh, you know i had mickey rat and we played all these places together and these were big gigs you know so it was a culture shock moving to la playing in front of 20 people all of a sudden, you know, and doing that for a couple of years and me going through all these musicians. But San Diego, yeah, there was a lot of talent coming out of it. Craig Goldie, um, Dio, uh, I mean, I'm missing a few. Tommy Asakawa was in my first band, Warrior, in the band Warrior. Uh, a bunch of guys. Yeah, Amir, Amir Darak. Amir, Amir, there you go, Amir Darak. Uh, I mean, I'll remember more names. Uh, Gene Hunter, he was a, G, a bass player in G, uh, uh, Jakey's band, uh, who spent time in, in Mickey Rat. And uh, quite an, an interesting bunch. But the minute I saw Van Halen in 78, you know, a friend of mine just forced me, you have to see this band in LA. So I take myself up there, it's in the book. And I get in. Anyway, long story short, I become friends with Ed Van Halen. I introduce a lot of my buddies to Ed, Robin, Tommy, and and, and uh, actually had Dave and, and Ed come down to San Diego one time to find out where we bought a pair of shoes that we wore on stage that actually they ended up wearing on the second Van Halen record. Mm. I mean, the stories are crazy, you know. But the minute I moved up, the minute I saw Van Halen, I'd go back to San Diego going, you guys, there's this band up there that is going to change everything. And lo and behold, you know, uh, we saw Van Halen uh, progress and my, as my friends. And in 1980, I just went, I got to get up there. I'm watching Van Halen just become this monster group. They came out of the whiskey. They started at Kazari's. Let's go. And that's what happened. The minute I moved up, a lot of people got a clue. I knew what I was talking about when I saw this band, Van Halen. You know, uh, it was it was intense. It was great.
And one of the great things about the movie is, so you're back at the whiskey and you tell the story about how you first met Van Halen. You were essentially just a fan hanging out and you had some weed and you asked yes. David Lee Roth if you want to smoke a joint. Yeah. And, and you built a friendship with Eddie Van Halen. You guys are trading yeah. gear and, uh, and that was a friendship all the way up until he passed because you were still, see, you know, would still see it. Sure. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, I was more of a guitar player singer doing the, the Paul Stanley kind of thing. You know, nobody could sing my songs like me or that I wanted. So I decided to sing and play rhythm guitar. Well, I used to dig Vox, old Vox heads and old gear. And Ed happened to be doing the same thing. And uh, it, when I did meet him the first time, you, you know, smoking a joint with Dave, I was just blown away because we we dug the same gear. He had a box 30 head. He needed another one for the next show at the Whiskey. And I said, I have one. And from then on, it was just crazy. You know, I got more into singing, but not losing my guitar stuff, you know. Um, so, end result, um, I mean, we, we learned a lot from those guys, Robin and them, from, from Ed, uh, down to, I mean, all these tricks, because there was no Floyd Rose. There was no, you know, all these things you have now to lock your strings in. Ed knew how to wire them in the back and, and the use of springs and coins and boiling strings and digging through the trash cans at Charvel, uh, getting the bodies, you know, that they throw away. I mean, we experienced some of that. It, it, it's just nuts, you know, uh, to think back, you know. Well, and it's funny, so we're talking about guitar playing and, and just rewinding in the movie, and you, you alluded to it a little bit here, you were in an accident, you were on your bicycle, you were hit by yeah. a car, and you broke both of your legs. You actually go to the, the actual spot where it happened. What was that like for you? It was kind of creepy. You know, um, I had been there years and years, but it was a little different vibe because, you know, I had lost both parents at the house. We rehearsed in every room, had backyard parties there, charged a buck ahead. You know, so Mickey Rat can be heard and seen, and and it was it was surreal, you know. But uh, I mean, I didn't know. I got thrown into this, you know, and it was being laid up in the hospital and in my book, and somebody went, "Here's a guitar," and I just adapted to this instrument, you know, and I still am. <laughs> if it wasn't for the, if it wasn't for that accident, maybe there never is a music career for you. Maybe you go on to be a top fuel, you know, race car driver. I would have a hundred percent because I'm still involved with the sport now. Matter of fact, coming up, there's a race and uh, we throw the rat banner on these cars. We're very fortunate and, and uh, it's, it's just fun, you know? Yeah. It's it was just, definitely your passion then and, and obviously still is now music yeah. just, uh, obviously took off after your injury. And so it's great in this movie, we get to see you play some guitar. And I think people are so used to you being the singer for rat, but when right. we see you play, we really hear that rat sound. The way you wrote these songs, the way you play chords mm. is the traditional rat um, sound. Yeah. Yeah, the early Mickey rat. Uh, and, and it was cool that, you know, Warren got in there right as we were really starting to, you know, write. He was young. When Warren joined rat, he was 19. Mm -hmm. He just turned 19 or something. And, and when... And Robin, of course, turned me on to all this heavy music, Priest, Except, uh, Maiden, and, you know, and here I'm listening to Blue Oyster Cult, uh, Zeppelin, uh, Aerosmith, uh, you know, and <laughs> the world's collided. But then, then you got the songs uh, um, like uh, You Got It, Sweet Cheater, uh, Tell the World, In Your Direction. Those are old Mickey Rat songs that I've written and a bunch of other ones you know drive me crazy you can kind of tell my riffs like you say you can yeah. notice them but no, people thought i just yelled at you yeah but no i write songs and stuff too <laughs> yeah absolutely i want to talk about robin crosby a little bit the king yeah. um first of all tell me how you met robin because you guys really had a lifelong friendship mm -hmm. Um, I met Robin, like I say, in, in bands in San Diego. You know, I put up posters um, when we do uh, uh, 
get into pre-production for the back for more uh, program, we'll call it, it, it's going to be crazy because we're going to go back and actually revisit a lot of things. And we were, you know, we met just in bands in San Diego. He would have his band and mine and we do gigs and that's how we met. But the ironic thing is he lived down the street, no shit, down the street from my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I take my grandmother to the market uh, once a week, right? And I'd run into him and I'd go, well, where do you live? And he told me where, and I'm like, you're right down the street from my grandmother. Well, anyway, once we really became like kind of tight and hanging out in San Diego, I, we were always hanging out together. You know, he had his La Jolla beach crowd, but we were from the little rougher kind of village in San Diego, like, you know, Jakey Lee. <laughs> um, but you you got us together back then and and uh we started writing back then robin and i you know we were in different bands but we were always playing so it was kind of interesting that we would end up in a band writing songs you know hey, absolutely and you know it in the beginning it wasn't so much uh, with rat it wasn't so much that warren was the lead guitar player they both played a lot of guitar uh, you know and robin played some very signature parts yeah. later on it started to change was that a, like a label decision to maybe make no. more of the guitar hero no because robin was pretty much our main guy at first and warren was progressing so well he was living with jakey learning the tunes right because jakey had just left mickey rat well jakey was playing these songs direction back for more you got it cheater uh um so warren picked up a lot of riffs from him and brought him to the rat camp when he eventually did join the band. Um, I might get a little lost here, but it, uh, um, the writing was pretty much, uh, I mean, the playing was Robin. He was our lead guy. Mm -hmm. and But Warren was progressing so rapidly. I mean, it was just crazy how, how fast. And, and it was our decision, Robin and I, we've got to make this guy uh, a lead guy. He has to be our secret weapon, you know? And that's what we did. We threw him on, uh, gave him his own spot up on, you know, side of the stage in a way. We just let him just grow, you know, and that he did. It obviously worked. Yeah. So in the movie, you talk about the last song that you wrote with Robin Crosby, but you yeah. don't say what the song is. So can you tell us? The song is... Uh, Oh God, I'd have to look it up. Yeah, he came by and we hung out and and I asked him if what, what riffs he had. And that's what we did back in the day. All of us, we got a riff, you got a riff, you know. Um, and he did, showed me a riff and, and I arranged the song, put it together and recorded it. Um, uh, the, the top of my head, I, I can't remember. Still. It's on one of your solo records though, right? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll figure it. We'll we'll find it. I might remember here in a minute. Yeah. No. Listen. You, you've got a whole history of songs, and there's a lot to to cover. Again, uh, in in the movie, which is available on Asai TV right now, nothing to lose. You go to the home where your uh, where you grew up, but also where your parents passed away. I don't yeah. think people know that you really are a spiritual guy. Um, I think that's something people don't see of you. And, and I can see the moment you go into the bedroom where you're your parents past is, is, is definitely a, a moment. Yeah. Well, of course you fear, you know, you don't fear <laughs> the one then, you know, I, I, I don't know, to each his own, but yeah, I'm, I grew up a, you know, Catholic boy and I wasn't so great in school, but <laughs> I, I still have those, you know, morals. And that was something that was instilled in me by, uh, a mother bringing up four kids, you know, and uh, cracking a whip, you know, fear God, appreciate, you know, and and it works. <laughs> Believe well, me. I'll, I'll tell you, Stephen, you know, I experienced some tragedy in my life and you were nice enough to reach out. That is the kind of person you are, privately reach out. And uh, you were telling me some things about how you still talk to Robin Crosby to this day, that you, you still feel Robin's presence and communicate. And one of the great things you said is that if someone passes away, if you want to speak to them, you have to ask them. And if you reach out, 
that you will make that contact. And, and, uh, and I think that's a really powerful thing that not everyone understands, but something that obviously you believe. Yeah, most definitely. And, and it's like my twin sister. I, I feel her around all the time. You know, I, I sense her in the other room like I, she's talking or I can say, hey. And the same with Robin. If I'm writing or something, you know, I'll just go, what do you got? You know, and, and why not? You know, we don't know. You know, uh, if that be the case, when I come back, I'm going to be smacking all kinds of people around. <laughs> well, but, yeah, I do believe, yeah, that they're that you can definitely, you know, have peace and, and, and still communicate. It, it's up to, it's up to you, you know? Yeah, absolutely, Stephen. And so when we're looking at this original house, the homeowner was nice enough to let you guys in to film it. Yeah. In, the, in the garage painted on the wall is the, probably the original rat logo. Yeah, that goes back. It's, it, it, it's crazy. I mean, just going back there, there was a vibe. I mean, most definitely for me. I mean, I'm into some interesting things in Soviet. That's my trip. And there was definitely a vibe there. And then just seeing that just brought back so many memories. Just like almost instantly I saw like 20 million things going on in front of me. You know, the parties, the family, the, the pets, the, the rehearsing in every single room in that house. That's how supportive my mom was. She was like, do what you got to do. Play in every room. I really don't care. Oh, you're having a backyard party. Okay, great. Uh, make sure everybody's gone by this time, you know? So uh, it was really surreal going back there again. It really was. Yeah, and it's something that, like you were saying, it's rarely done. Very, you can read about these locations in the book. You can hear the stories, Rat Mansion West. These are right. infamous places in the history of Rat. But to actually go back and see them and to see the bathroom window that you call the front door. It, it's yeah, crazy. I was bummed that we were bummed that we couldn't uh, get into Rat Mansion West. But just picture a one-bedroom studio apartment and Robin... Uh, slept against one wall you know, in a single bed. I slept in the other wall and war somebody had a cot on the other wall. might have been war worn. And our gear and everything shoved in this one in the living room. And I mean, we do what you got to do, you know, and that's what we did. The Rat Mansion West was by far a mansion. And the front door was that window. Yeah, nobody had keys. So, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, because we hear about Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses, but to see the house where Rat started, and a lot of those Motley Crue guys were coming and going through that window. Yeah, and, of course. And, and it's well. the same with the, the Motley pad, you know. They didn't use their front door. They crawled in a window. I mean, it's just when you got so much. <laughs> that's what was great about that whole decade, the beginning of the 80s scene in, in L.A., you know, uh, it, it was so refreshing, so new, and, and it was exciting, and you, you just, anything went, you know, it didn't matter, anything went, you know, yeah. uh, and that's when, you know, you had a band called Rock's Regime, and that was Striper, and they knew how to party, and then you had Great White, who was Dante Fox, and I mean, it goes on and on, you know, it was a great scene. Yeah, you once told me that you Rat was just as messed up as Motley Crue and just as crazy. You just didn't film it. That's right. Yeah, we don't. Uh, we considered ourselves champagne to uh, Jack Daniels, but then somehow we got into Jack Daniels years later. So, yeah, we didn't. We didn't really get, care to be press darlings, and that was the difference. We, you know no disrespect or anything. I mean, we were brothers, you know, I mean, I have stories that I'm going to tell in the part two that people are going to trip that has to do with Motley, you know, and us hanging and playing and musicians coming and going. I mean, it was the craziest scene. So it, with nothing to lose, I'm pretty much taking you from where it all started uh, to the whiskey's stardom you know graduating from gazaris the same stage where the doors van halen and rat started you know the whole routine so yeah absolutely a lot of history there and so you also said before that rat's not the most dysfunctional band in the world 
I beg, I beg, I beg to differ on that one. Uh, oh yeah. I think you guys are pretty dysfunctional. Now, spoiler alert: in the movie, yeah. Bobby Blotzer does make an appearance, and this is a pretty shocking thing to some people, myself slightly included, because you guys have had a rocky friendship long before the present day, since the beginning. He's, you know, he's a personality, as with most bands, you're going to have that. Sure. So. Yeah. All of a sudden, uh, we're going back a little bit. You know, Bobby Blotzer decided to have his own band that uh, of, uh, I regrettably was involved with that, that we call Fake Rat. This was 2015, 2016. This ended in a lot of lawsuits, a lot of lawsuits. Well, so, it wasn't the first. And, 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 you know, just to cut that short because it's such old news look we're like brothers man you fight you this you that and and you know you gotta understand we lived together like 300 days out of the year you know for years there was no break there was no stopping and that was the machine in the 80s you know just keep it going keep it going one of our biggest mistakes like uh, the hindsight is not taking a year off uh, which probably would have helped all of us, but that's why in 1991 I had to kind of put the brakes on things. I knew somebody was going to go down if I if I didn't. So I'm glad I did because it served two purposes. It, it not only kept us alive longer, uh, it kept us out of that whole grunge era, you know. Right. So you know. Well, and. There's always been anticipation for what Rat will do next. Obviously, there, there's a lot of that right now. So my, I, I know that you're, you're a believer. You know, life is short. You guys are, you know, Robin's not here, but there are four of you who are here. And so I know that, I mean, it, it is amazing, Stephen, though, that you're a forgiving guy because, you know, Bobby Blotzer sued you. He called you every name in the book publicly. And you stayed pretty quiet. You're not the type of person who goes into the media and slings mud back. There was a lot of crazy things, but you kind of amended fences and you get, he, and Bobby got up and performed with you. Yeah, which that is, was great. That was great the, the, at the whiskey, it was great. We're gonna end up doing another one with a live audience, um, alive again. Uh, I don't know if it will be at the whiskey, but yeah, Bobby came out and played. Like I say, you know, I mean, look, all of us had our rounds, everyone, mm -hmm. it just wasn't me you know, against whoever, uh, we all had our rounds as, as most bands do. And well, we're going to get to those other guys. <laughs> we're going to get to those other rounds. Really, well, we might not have that much time, but, but well, anyway, we're going to get, to them. you know, the long, I mean, that's how you get longevity. I don't know. I don't know. We've always gotten back together because it's the music, you know, and that's my main concern. Is Absolutely. And you've shown that and you show that in, in the movie by performing. And so when when you see Bobby enter the room, seeing you for the first time in eight years, you yeah. guys get along really well. Yeah. As a viewer, I do get the feeling that this is a guy who kind of, he has no stake to rat right now. And if he's gonna play again, he better figure out how to get along with you and everyone else. Well, look, here, it goes like this. You know, the bands that have had this kind of longevity, and thank God for that, because, you know, there are bands that never got the time of day in the 80s that are getting more airplay and, and notice than ever before. Uh, we're not the most dysfunctional, dude. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, there's bands who don't see each other. And they just get on stage and take care of business. There is still a business in the music business, if you want it there to be. Uh, so... And with Bob, I mean, it's not just Bob. We all had our rounds. I mean, that's just the way it works. You know, you've been in a band with the band of brothers for so many years. You know, you piss on each other and shit happens. Um, but I did state, you know, I see no reason doing a rap record unless it's the all the original members. There's no reason. I can just write songs and do what I do because... It makes me happy. I can do it whenever I want. Uh, so, I don't well, rely Steve, on anybody, you know. There's a couple things missing from the movie. This is one. Mm. Uh, so, you tell me, when is the last time you spoke to Warren D. Martini? 
Um, indirectly, probably a couple weeks ago. So, like email? Uh, no, through sources. <laughs> now, there's. Uh, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, everybody's talking about reunion and this. Hey, look, like I say, life's short. You know, I can sit around and, and do nothing, but that's not the kind of person I am, whether it's in the music business or anything else. Uh, I just move forward. So if, if there's if something goes down with the original members, that would be great. If it doesn't, say la vie. I, have you reached out to Warren about doing something? I'm not talking about any of this because it's it'll just get turned into something else. Right. But no, we're not talking about anything. But it would be nice. It would be uh, an interesting. It would it would be do very well for the legacy. Put it that way, you know. I think it would do amazing for it, and the, it, we're going on forty years of Rat. And we're going on thirty seven. Okay, well, but we're getting close. 82, right? You put out uh, Tell yeah. the World? Yeah, I put out Tell the World. That was with a different bass player. Uh, that was Gene Hunter from San Diego on bass and Kurt Meyer from Salty Dogs on drums and Robin and Warren and myself. Uh, yeah, Metal Massacre, by the way. And I think Matt so, Thorne was on bass on that. You're, you're correct. I'll take that back. Yeah, Matt. Matt is our right arm in top fuel records you know we record there on another subject i'm getting ready to do my sixth solo record now it's a double album because we have such great material and a lot of it why not it's never been done i've never done it so it's going to be done and, and also, the solo records are great i mean i think that you know the last one came out a view to a kill i believe came out 2018 so yes and we obviously everyone lost some time so there's time to make yeah. uh you know to get those now the double disc set out and yeah and matt yeah. matt says you know he's known you obviously for all of those 37 years he says he's never had a fight with you once you yeah. know just that you're that guy he does tell a great story though about yeah. the back for more because he wrote yes. part of it with you Actually, yeah, he did have a, a, a tab of writing in back for more. I mean, it, you know, that's why I say well, all, well, these guys are all rat bastards to me, you know, hence my solo group. It's all guys I've been in bands with for years off and on. They can come in any time, whether it's Robbie Crane, whether it's my old bass player from this band, Arcade, or it's, or it's Matt, or it's... Greg D'Angelo. You know, Greg D'Angelo on drums. It could be uh, um, Scotty Coogan on drums. It could be Bobby Blotzer on. You know, it just, I, I, <laughs> you know, rats cannot be exterminated. We're building an army, you know. So, yeah, yes, and, and, great people. Yeah, so, I mean, and Rat Bastards is kind of the brand of for your gang of guys who've been involved yeah. with, with you. And uh, we'll get, we're going to get that, and you're on the road with it. I, I got to go back a little bit about the, this hopeful of potential reunion. What does Juan Crucier think about it? I don't hear about Juan very much. I think everybody, you know, I'm, it's not like I'm instigating here. I'm, I'm just hearing the people. I'm just hearing our audience, right? Of course they would love it. It would be a great thing. So I'm just relaying what our audience, you know, our friends who are fans uh, are, are expressing. That's all I'm doing. And, and I'm not saying it's going to happen or it's not. I'm just saying, these, you know, our fans would kind of dig that. So let's keep it, in a, let's keep it up here, you know, and, and see what happens. Well, and, and you are saying, it. yeah, you're saying you're in. You'll work with these guys if they well, can work It's together. not going to happen without me, I'll tell you that much. So. <laughs> they, they tried that. It didn't work out. Um, <laughs> no, it won't. No, it yeah, won't. But so you and Juan are playing some rat days right now, right dates right now. I believe that those are probably contractually obligated. Yeah, you're right, and and we're gonna finish up. Uh, we have one more in August. We'll finish that up and then regroup and and see what happens. I have a lot of things going down, uh, which is gonna take me away from doing, uh, you know, any kind of extensive rat shows or rat shows. Uh, there's just not enough time to. Uh, to set something up. So we'll kick back and, and, and re restructure things and see where we're at with rat. 
as as you know Juan and myself. So that uh, lineup yeah, is going to be on hold. Yeah, yeah. I have soul shows going down, and uh, we were actually going to discuss it the other day, Juan and I. And uh, I just mentioned, hey, there's a lot going on with me right now. I just need some time, and and uh, we'll pick it up later. So that's what we're going to do. You know, pick it up later and see what happens. Yeah. So to to recap, what you've already said, Stephen, is that. There will not be any rat music unless the four surviving members are recording it together. You're not going to put out an album with the, the current lineup. And if, yeah. if not, you'll make your solo music, which is you're still the voice of rat. And these are great records. And yeah. if everyone can get together, um, then we, we could see a reunion possibly, you know, uh, down the road. It seems like it seems like we got to get a hold with Warren. <laughs> Stephen, why did Warren not last that last time back. Why did you and Juan end up without Warren? You know, I don't know. I'm just staying out of a lot of questions that don't need to be answered. All I know is I said a bit ago, and I'm just giving Warren the respect back. And, you know, he wouldn't want to record a record without me. So I'm just doing the same thing. We had a great deal offered uh, uh, pre-COVID. I mean, insane. And I was ready to go. I had songs, started writing rap music. I mean, anything I write anyway is going to be considered, to me, rap music. And, mm -hmm. and it goes where it goes. So, you know, uh, I'm glad that didn't happen. Warren didn't do it. And I'm just doing the same thing. But this time I'm saying it out loud. I'm not going to do it. Don't expect a rap record unless it's all the original members. And as far as the reunion, because we'll cut this right now, is is... Hey, I don't know. Anything's possible. Uh, I'm not saying yay or nay. So All right. I wouldn't count on it, though. But we'll I see. hear you. It, it, a lot we'll of see. things have to fall into line. I'm going to call Warren right after this and try to <laughs> It's well, I mean, put it this way. Look, look, I mean, I have other things I'm involved with, and, and it's not always about my time in, in the band I started here, Rad. It's, it, it's, it's still number one, you know, uh, but there's other things to do in life when you get older and wiser, you know? Well, so. Stephen, uh, more importantly than music is your health. And yeah. so I want to talk a little bit about your, you know, you privately were battling cancer, liver cancer. I mm -hmm. don't think anyone really knew Stephen. Uh, you went through this for about three years and you were still playing shows in mm -hmm. that time. So tell me, Stephen, when do you discover that you, that you have liver cancer? Uh, well, I don't want to dwell on this either because it's just something I think everybody should really take a rain check, especially if you lived hard like us in this decade of decadence, the 80s, we call it, because there was payback and it's a bitch. Uh, um, but I found out and dealt with it and it's a ongoing process to care for it. And the reason I came out now about it is I don't want it to turn into something, you know, something that I don't like. And just to make people aware, it's okay to get checked up. Yeah, if, see if you have hepatitis, see if everything's okay, you know. Uh, and then get back out and rock and roll, you know, uh, whether you're a fan or a musician, you know. I mean, look, I mean, our guys are dropping all the time, you know what I'm saying? Uh, life's short. We're not indestructible. Yeah, and that goes with our friends, our fans. I call our fans friends. I hate that word fans, but, you know, uh, it is what it is. But, you know, hey, a lot of these people we've become really good friends with in our audience. You yeah, know? a lot of years together. Yeah, and you run into some of these people and you go through their trip with them. I talk to some of our friends our friends fans about their personal shit and and you know them losing a member a family member or something or their health and it, it's okay i'm not a therapist i don't know all the answers i just say hey get get a tune up get a check and then you'll find out and with me i was fortunate to catch it but now it's an ongoing process to keep it under control and I know plenty of other people in the business that are going through the same thing and not everybody knows. So I'm just one of them that's saying, get a tune up, get a checkup, 
because yeah. if, you know uh you never know so that's where we're going to leave that everything's way copacetic you know yeah Stephen, just a um and I got the impression that it's not something you're comfortable talking with. Your fiance talks about it in the movie, so you get yes. that feeling. She she talks about it more, and I understand it's something that was pri uh, personal and private to you. But we mm -hmm. do want to make sure that people understand that early screening can save lives. Yes, and, 100%. And maybe you can tell us what it what is the process so that people can get checked out. Well, just get a blood test, you know, and and, and see if everything's okay. That you don't have hepatitis because a lot of bad liver and kidney and things come from obviously drinking and other things but you might not even know you have the worst hep on the planet well you can get rid of it you know uh so just take care of your health you know and and in moderation you know eventually you learn it or you lose it as we know a lot of our peers of mine have all have passed away doing you know not really taking care of themselves and Thank God I got a wake up call because, you know, I'm, hey, I lived and breathed that whole scene and, and you know, <laughs> you live and learn, you know. You live yeah, and, and for those who don't know, you did contract hepatitis from a blood transfusion. Yeah, I did. Is and that when you were saying, kids? That's what I'm saying. You don't know. That nobody really knows. Uh, so just you know get a tune-up i call it get a checkup and and, it, and it's all good here and the worst thing that i did go through with was the knee surgeries it's not a boo-hoo but when you get a staph infection it's fucked you know and that's what happened to one of my knees uh and that was a brutal thing but you know what i get out there and do what i gotta do and that's it you know, well, I was traveling with you during that time when you were getting the, the second knee worked on, and it was really hard for you to, to be on stage with that extreme pain. Even just to walk yes. through airports was really hard on you. And you were also dealing with the cancer scare at that time. So there was so much. Did you just feel, Stephen, I promised to do these gigs and I'm going to see it through? That was, that's me, man. I'm a cement pirate from back in the day you know we would play anywhere do anything to to get this band to where we wanted it and that's just the way i am you know i just move forward and and attack things head on you know i had a commitment it's my band it's our band it's our legacy get the job done you know everybody fucks up now and then everybody you know you can't tell me <laughs> put it this way every lead singer on the planet has fallen off the stage so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. well, I get what you're. I get what you're saying. And Stephen, you you are, you know, because of your scare, you, you're you're living sober, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. A long time. It's been a while. Yeah, which is which is great for for your health and obviously performances as well. And sure. uh, you do continue the legacy of Rat, no matter what, whether it is Rat Bastards, whether it's your solo records, the music is alive. You still play it. Obviously, we said the future is uncertain, but that doesn't matter. You're going to continue no matter what. Yeah. And I'll tell you, once we get into um, pre-production on the Back From War series, it, it, it's not just going to be, it's not just about me. It, you know, I'm going to be, inter we, we are going to be interviewing many artists. Uh, it could be race car drivers, sports guys, but it'll start out rock and roll. And it's going to blow a couple, it's going to blow some minds. It's going to blow some minds. And and there will be a part two and a part three of um, the docuseries. And we'll see where it ends up. And that's where we have to be hopeful and positive and move forward. Yeah. You and Christy, uh, you know, your fiance, who's also your business partner and, and yeah. co-producer in these things, you guys have a really great team together. You work well. And it's great to see you kind of getting this out. People can go to officialstephenpiercy.com. Yeah, that's where you can pretty much find everything to do with yeah. your career. Yeah, there's a lot of work. I mean, we have our hands full. She's got her hands full, and and with our manager, my manager, and stuff. There's a lot going on, and and hey, look, something's got to change out there. You know, I mean, you know, I love I love what the music Rat created. I love to 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 leave a great legacy for us, and but. Uh, We'll take it from there. We'll see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a new time. So to have this technology and to be doing things the way you do it is great because you're staying up on it. You know, it's 
you yeah. can't just live in the past, obviously. And so it'd be really good to see where this uh, series goes. I want to remind people again, it's called Nothing to Lose. It's available on Asai TV, which is spelled S, uh, excuse me, A-S-Y, yeah, A-S-Y-T-V.com. And it's available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Roku, pretty much anywhere you can get it on your phone. It's really easy to download. And there's all kinds of other content on there too. It's not just Steven's movie. So you, yeah. you get a whole channel uh, of stuff. And so- Oh yeah, you can watch Andy and Mayberry. I don't know, you can watch anything on there. The best thing about this is it really is the first time that you know I've taken people through the whole incarnation of this band, Rad, that people have learned, you know, that I've loved for so many years. I mean, I still enjoy getting out there. I mean, it's crazy, these faces smiling. I mean, the last shows, people getting out again. You know, it's incredible. You know, it's a good feeling. And you must also be amazed about how young some of the fans are. Now there's Geico commercials and, uh, you know. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, you, you know, you do some of these gigs and you know, I mean, there is part of the show where I ask the people, you know, how they're doing and when, they, when did they start listening to us? And, and I can tell they, you know, they probably got drugged to the show that day, you know, and brought to the show. Here, come to the show and see this band, Rat. I used to see them when I was younger, you know. And there you go. You got these youngsters, and, you know, uh, uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, we're, we're, we're fortunate. And also, your daughter makes a little bit of a cameo in the movie as well. So, you, <laughs> you're, you're, you know, you're a family man in, in, in top of all the rock and roll. Sure, yeah. You grow up eventually, and, and kids will do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, boy, yeah. I, I could. I can only imagine, Stephen. You, like I said, you're a rock and roll survivor. You're also a very loyal guy. You're a good friend, and I think anyone who knows you would say uh, the same. Uh, I really appreciate you jo uh, joining me today yeah. and and promoting this movie that I really think people will like. It is a different approach, and you're going to see yeah. history that you haven't seen before. Yeah, we wanted to take a different approach, and you know. Uh, Part two and three are going to be uh, very interesting. I mean, we're just barely just chipping away at the stone here. So a lot more to look forward to. Well, and Stephen, like you said, you know, you filmed this uh, rockumentary during the pandemic. So it was a little bit difficult. You know, even your show at the Whiskey, there was no audience. And right. so you're going to these places and doing what you can in a time when things are shut down. Now that mm -hmm. things are starting to change, there's only so much more that you could do. Yeah, and we will, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, what's going to be great in, in the next uh, um, um, part two is the crazy years, the arenas, the, the, that next step. And then you'll get into the even groovier shit. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good, uh, a good tease right there. So everyone go check it out. Check out officialstephenpiercy.com and you'll see him on the road. Stephen's not yeah. going anywhere. No, I'm out there. You know, I'll be busy doing some other uh, business things from the next few months, but yeah, there'll be a show here and there, and we'll see what happens uh, with Rat. And, hey, we just want to keep Rat rolling, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. All right, Stephen, thank you so much. Peace out, brother. Thank you.